It's a great day here in South Carolina. It's February 3rd, and we have our special guest today is Beth Carey, clerk of court for Lexington County. And she's here to talk about the facts, the facts of the clerk of court's office. And we have a number of guests that you see behind me. Senator Ronnie Cromer showed up. Didn't know he was coming today, but he's always welcome. But Beth is our, our feature speaker, so this will be a great day. And, it's, and after we sing the Ponzi song, gets us off to that start, we're going to have a, about a 10 15 minute discussion about Beth and then, then convert over to our normal discussion. Any Friday, if you're coming through South Carolina, please stop by and visit the Casey Mafia here at Shawnee's next to the airport. Until next week, Steve Ice signing off. And Beth, it's so, so good to have you with us. Thank you very much okay. for having me. Okay. Look forward to this. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, America. Good morning, uh, Ron. Ron's here to take the video again, and thanks for thanks for doing all the hard work, Ron. Appreciate it. We got uh, Senator Ronnie Cromer. Uh, let's get him. Let's morning. give him a hand, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Our featured speaker today is uh, Beth Carey, Clerk of Court for Lexington County. Uh, Beth called me about uh, coming back to educate us on the facts of the office. So if you'll notice the marquee outside says just the facts. So that's what she's going to do. Is she's at the tax today. I've learned more about the uh, that office and the registry of deeds than I ever thought I'd know. Sure. No. And if you remember, uh, where's Mr. Burge? Bill Burge uh, writes articles and letters to the Wall Street Journal from time to time. And the Ponzi scheme song originated and is dedicated to to <laughs> Bill Burge. Bill Burge. And uh, Mr. Eddix, author of uh, the famous 1980 hardback book we, we found about, found out about a few weeks ago that Paul C. Graham introduced to us about whiskey spills. He can't make it today. He had to, he had to leave early. But uh, we're going to start off with a Ponzi scheme song. And David James had requested the Mountain View song. And uh, Mr. Eddix, if you will lead us in that, and then we'll go with our big singer. Okay. Uh, Look, if you have a copy of this, what's the chorus we have to sing? We do have a chorus right there. You have the chorus there, David? Good Lord, Charlie, Charlie Ponzi. Well, I, I don't sing the words, and y'all just sing the chorus one time with it. We'll get some little whip. But we have to uh, <laughs> acknowledge the Ponzi song for, well, that Mr. Bill Burbage has worked hard at this, and it. I, I'm taking the uh, lighter side of this, but I have a great deal of respect for him and for his uh, concern over the Social Security uh, situation. I also draw Social Security, and we uh, we know what a mess the Social Security uh, uh, funds and system is in. Uh, for those of you that don't need to do a little study on it. But this was a lighthearted thing that we did uh, in respect for Mr. Bill Burbage. And if you've got a copy of it, kind of follow along. But this is where you say thank you to everybody that's still working, that's paying you for years. Yeah. yeah. Those of y'all that are still working. And I mean, there's an erroneous uh, belief going around that the y'all who are still working are paying yeah. my Social Security. And I want to straighten that out for a while. Yeah, straighten that out, and then I paid for my Social Security. And the government stole it. it. Your politicians stole it. They aren't my politicians. <laughs> Not mine either. Now, we go from there. I don't know how to correct it, but I know. And Mr. Gettings, the, the chorus is, Good Lord, Charlie Ponzi. Yeah, you, you see it right there. It says right above it. Chorus. Some people don't have a copy. I just want to oh, play. Okay. <laughs> Good Lord, well, Charlie Ponzi, what have you done? That's cool. But it's just you kind of a story stories. about what happened. After World War I, <laughs> things were really bad. Poor people lost everything they had. They didn't have no food, no job, no car. Then upon the scene came FDR. Good Lord, Charlie Ponzi, what, what have you done? You show the, the politicians how to work your tricks. That you took all that money, money. now we're in a fix. Well, he promised everybody an awful lot. A good job and a chicken in every pot. Yeah, we're hearing that now. The people said, man, this sounds so good. Said they'd vote for him if he thought he could. FDR said, I can get it done. I got Social Security for everyone. Good Lord, oh, Charlie Ponzi, what have you done? He got all excited. He was on the road. Going to take care of everybody when they got old. How's he going to do it? They said, what the heck? 
We just take a little money out of every box check, invest it for you. And when you get old, you'll get a nice pension when you're 61, too. <laughs> Good Lord, Charlie Ponzi, what have you done? You so Put it all in the bank and invest it for you, and you have a nice pension when you're 62. Good Lord, Charlie Ponzi, what have you done? You showed the politicians how to work your tricks, and they took all that money, now we're in a fix. Good Lord, Charlie Ponzi, what have you done?
last week there were some allegations made and some, some misinformation that was given. The person that spoke to you last week um, implied that she was a school teacher and an educator. That information is absolutely invalid. And um, she has a two-year degree. She does not have a school teacher certificate. She never taught school in Virginia. And that information is available for review. And the documentation is available for review. There's the information from the University of South Carolina where she received a two-year degree in the 70s. And here's a letter from the Commonwealth of Virginia that states she was never employed there. I think it's, it, it, it's important to understand if you are going to certify that you're someone and you've done something, that you are accurate in the information that you provide. Um, second of all, I want to make sure everybody's clear that I do have a degree. I did attend the University of South Carolina. I even brought my transcripts and where I graduated from the University of South Carolina because all I did was study law um, for four years. That's what I did. Now, I don't have a law degree, but I certainly all I did was take law classes at the University of South Carolina. And that's all I've done for 20 years. I brought my resume because for the last 20 years, all I've done is work for law firms and be the clerk of court. I have an abundance of experience with the law, and I think that's necessary. Unless you're going to be an attorney to run the courthouse, you need to have a factual basis for what you're doing. So let's talk about the clerk of court and what we do there. The clerk of court's office is the keeper of the records, and we keep the records for every lawsuit that's ever filed in Lexington County, whether it's common pleas, family court, or general sessions. And general sessions is criminal court. We keep the records for the probate court. We keep the records for liens that are filed in the courthouse. We keep juvenile records. We keep adoption records. We actually schedule the docket for family court and for common pleas, which is civil court. General sessions is run by the solicitor. That's our job. We schedule the dockets for the family court judges every week, week by week, year the year that goes by. We handle all those records. I handle all the foreclosure documents. I actually sign off on those for the Master in Equity in Lexington County. That is a huge responsibility when you take someone's life in your hands, when they're getting ready to lose their home. And I have hundreds that come across my desk every week, and it's only gotten worse when the economy has come down. Now, I'll tell you, there are a lot that I just don't sign. I review each and every one of those documents before I put my signature on it because that's your life. That's your livelihood. And I don't know if you remember or not, but a year ago when the banks were just signing off on those in bulks and people were losing <coughs> their houses and the banks were making a lot of mistakes, there were stacks that sat on my desk like this and I just refused to sign them until I had a, an order from the Chief Justice. In fact, I had some disagreements with the, the judges about them, but they sat on my desk and some of those were recalled because it's important. Everything we do at the courthouse affects someone's life every day. People go to jail. People are adopting children. People are paying child support. It affects every, every decision we make there affects someone's life. Now, when I ran for the clerk of court's office in 2004, I made some promises, and I kept every one of them. I said that I was going to increase child support collections, and I said I was going to implement a, a child support debit card. There wasn't one in Lexington County. In fact, there wasn't one in the state. When I took over in 2005, many of you may remember and some of you may not, but I moved my bank accounts from BNT to MBSC. And I had quite a little tiff with Lexington County Council. My husband was a member at that time. But I had quite a little tiff with them, and they were upset with me because I moved my bank accounts. But it was important because BB&T, um, I wouldn't say they couldn't provide the services I wanted, but they didn't want to provide the services I wanted because Lexington County had just entered into a banking contract with them, and the services I wanted wasn't part of that agreement. And they didn't want to provide those services. So I went to a bank that would provide them. I spent $8,000 of my own money because I hired my own lawyers. Kirk Morgan, in fact, was just named the number one litigator in Lexington County this year. $8,000 out of my own pocket to fight what I thought was an important issue in Lexington County. After months and months, we sat down and negotiated with bb &T. They agreed to provide the services. I agreed that it wasn't worth the continued fight. I moved the bank accounts back to bb &T and 
the debit card was founded in Lexington County. We don't write checks anymore, and it saved the taxpayers a lot of money. And I'm going to tell you how much money it saved the taxpayers. We saved the taxpayers $60,000 in postage every year. Just in postage every year because we don't mail out checks anymore. $60,000 a year over eight years, the two terms I've been in office, is a half a million dollars. Now you, on top of that, the manpower, not to cut the checks, the checks themselves, not to stuff the envelopes, not the core <coughs> of the checks to send them out, is about another half a million dollars over eight years. That's a million dollars that my administration has saved the taxpayers of Lexington County over eight years. Off of my $8,000 that I spent out of my own pocket, because it was important, because I made a promise to the taxpayers that that's what I wanted to do. I said I was going to increase child support in Lexington County, and that's what I did. Since um, 2004, when I took over, the collection of child support in Lexington County was $14,964,000. In 2011, we collected $17 million. That's a little more than $2 million every year that we've increased child support collections in Lexington County. The way that happens is that my staff and I went in and we reviewed and audited every child support case in Lexington County. And there are thousands of them. Mm -hmm. And you have to audit them. And we issue the rules of show causes and we issue the bench warrants for the judge to sign and they go to the sheriff's department. My predecessor chose not to have a relationship with the sheriff's department. He had a private process server and that was not a very successful program. We chose to make a successful program and we chose to partner with the Sheriff's Department and the Fugitive Task Force was born. When the Fugitive Task Force was born, we implemented Operation Stocking Stuffer and Operation Last Chance. In 2008 alone, Operation Last Chance, Operation Stocking Stuffer, for 30 days, we apprehended 127 persons. We concentrated on people who owed $10,000 or more this year. We apprehended 127 persons who owed more than $10,000 in child support. And we arrested people that owed $1.9 million in child support. Can you interrupt for a second? Dave, is somebody out there? You, hi, folks, everybody look. Look outside. There's a car out there. With, uh, not car. He's moving. He's moving when I move the blind sound. No, he's, he's sitting right here. He's sitting back there. Are we being paranoid here? I'm not being paranoid. I'm being cautious. Okay. I understand. What are you doing? Somebody moved up. Looks like a 19, 20-year-old, 21. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. You don't want to mess with your mafia. Yeah, this is all the... You don't want to mess with your mafia. You know we're not really a mafia, right? <laughs> don't tell anybody, Corey. <laughs> and I left my gun at home this morning. <laughs> oh, I got it. In Hopefully 30 days, we collected one. We we arrested people phone. or apprehended people that owed 1.9 million dollars in child support. Operation, and this was our sixth successful year in that. This is my eighth year in office. In Operation Last Chance in May. This is an opportunity for individuals to come in without the police kicking in the doors and make arrangements with the clerk of court's office to settle up your debt or make payment arrangements so you don't have to go to jail. Fifty people made arrangements to settle up $435,000 worth of child support this year in 2011. We are making changes. We are doing good things at the clerk of court's office. On top of that, I told him, I said, we've got we've to gotta save the taxpayers some money, some more money. I reduced my operating budget since 2005 by more than 35%. Here are the numbers. 35% I reduced my operating budget. That's taxpayers' dollars that we've reduced. We haven't added any staff, and we certainly haven't reduced any cases that we're handling. That's what the clerk of court's office is doing for the taxpayers. I've kept my promises. I've worked hard, and I want to continue to work hard. We have a new case management system, a child support case management system, that's set to deploy in 2013. Um, 
that I understand I'm not really supposed to know anything about, but I've worked on it for two years, and I've got another year's worth of work before it deploys. And we've been working with the state and the county department of social services and the judicial department. We are in the middle of a banking RFP right now. Part of our movement to save the taxpayers more money is that when the state case management system deploys in Lexington County, all the child support payments will be made at one central location. A bank out of New York won the RFP for this service, so all of Lexington County taxpayers' money would go through this bank in New York. Marsha and I have been working diligently. We've narrowed it down to three banks because there is one type of account that would converge with this new uh, program, child support case management programs, and we've narrowed down three banks that would give our citizens a bank account, even non-credit worthy citizens, a bank account that would converge with this new child support case management system that would keep all of our local taxpayers' dollars in a local bank in Lexington, South Carolina. <coughs> so maybe I'm not in the office every day. I certainly wasn't in the office every day last week because I was at the administration, inter in the administration building interviewing three banks to try to keep Lexington County taxpayer dollars in Lexington County. But I'm working. I'm working for Lexington County. That's what I'm doing. I have to take any questions. I have a question. How much in, in, in incarceration is uh, all the people that can't pay child support? I know the fellow that lives next door to me, he's three payments behind right now without a job. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what the cost factor is for the incarceration for all those people that couldn't make the money for paying child support. What dollars? Non-violent offenders, it costs the taxpayers of Lexington County $60 a day to house an inmate. However, with that said, we don't just throw people in jail. We do not just throw people in jail because they can't pay child support payments. If you're unemployed, if you don't have a job, you don't have a way to make payments, we work it out with you. We bring you in. We make arrangements. You can fill out pro se paperwork for a child support reduction. There are all types of ways. People that do go to jail right now, there are work release programs. People work throughout the county. They go to work for other companies to pay their child support payments. We don't just go out and apprehend people and throw them in the jail for the sake of throwing them in jail. Because I don't want to cost you money. I know it costs $60, but I'm on the, I'm on the jail overcrowding committee. Believe me, I know what it costs. Jane, and that is one more thing. I want to say one more thing. Because um, there was an allegation made that I spent money on a couch. You know what? No, I did spend money on a couch. I did spend money on a couch. For a judge who is 87 years old, is the longest serving judge in the state of South Carolina. His wife died February of last year. He's on a second bout of cancer and was going through chemotherapy treatments. He came to Lexington County to spend 14 weeks in Lexington County. He was on the bench every day at 9.15 in the morning. He worked till 5.30 or 6 o'clock every afternoon. And because of the chemotherapy treatments, he had fluid on his lungs, which he had to have removed by needle treatment once a week. He ate lunch in the courthouse and had to lay down for 45 minutes to an hour every day. But every day he got on the bench, he reduced our jail overcrowding by 25 to 30 cases every day. And by reducing, I mean he bonded people out, or he took pleas which sent them to SCDC and got them out of Lexington County Detention Center. Now, 25 cases a day over 15, 14 weeks at $60. Yeah, my question was, you're, you're talking about child support, and I realize this guy could have just been telling me this, but uh, I happened to be over at the voter registration office in Lexington, and somebody that works there said, hey, Eddie, you need to come speak to this guy. And there was a guy there, he was a, I guess, a parolee from the county. He was working, he was, he's in jail, but he works during the day over there. And he told me he, that uh, he, he was, did construction work. He said, I think he told me for 17 straight years he paid child support. And um, he lost his construction job. He got $400 behind. He got picked up, put in jail. And that's why he was in jail, because he was $400 behind on child support. He said he never missed a payment for 17 years. Now, he could have very well been lying to me, but I'm just letting you know. Well, let me, let me tell you this. Um, that is unlikely, and I will tell you why that is unlikely. That's something else I want to tell you about. We have, we have three judges, 
three family court judges for four counties. We are the 11th Judicial Circuit. That's Lexington, McCormick, Edgefield, and Saluda. Four counties, three family court judges to hear all of our family court issues. Now that's divorce, that's temporaries, that's juvenile cases, that's DSS, that's everything we hear, adoption, that's everything we hear in family court. So imagine, we only have court from 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, five days a week, in four counties with three judges. Our jail is only so big, and we're already overcrowded. Yeah. So imagine that our judges are not going to put somebody in jail unless they are a repeat offender. And I mean a habitual repeat offender. For $400, that is not. We have people walking the streets that owe $3,000. And if they have a legitimate reason why they have not paid their child support and they've made any attempt at all to make payments and support their children, they give them every opportunity to go home because they have to answer to the taxpayer too. They are not going to put somebody in jail at $60 a day when the jail is busting at the seams for $400 and he's never missed a payment. That is, I can assure you that that did not happen. Well, my, my, my follow-up on that, but it's not related to child support, is that I continually hear of prisoners being they're locked into the Lexington County Prison They've been there for three and four years and have yet to even see a judge. Well, okay, let's talk about that. We have two resident circuit judges, Judge McMahon and Judge Keasley. Judge Keasley is from, uh, from Edgefield. Judge McMahon is from Lexington County. Again, the 11th Judicial Circuit. We have four counties. We have two circuit judges. So why do you hold somebody in jail? Suppose they're innocent. They're sitting in jail three and four years based off. Who's going to hear the case? That, that's, that's not the prisoner's responsibility. That's, that's either yours okay. or, the, or the judicial systems or, the, or somebody, the solicitors system. or somebody's. It's the judicial system, and it is the legislature, and it is court administration get together, and based on a census of how many cases we have per capita in the county, that's how many judges we get to hear the cases. Terry, Star Terry Starkey. Terry Stark has a question. Well, I think we have to clarify. I believe that's happening in the criminal side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, and that is run by the solicitor's office. Okay. Well, it is run by the solicitor's office. office. But <laughs> I'm just saying, you have to understand that we have two judges for four counties. Now, like Judge uh, Cottingham, I just told you, he's 87 years old, a retired active Plus judge. They sent him in for you know, 14 weeks. I have to go back and look. It was more than three months. It was June, July, and August, and I think two weeks in September to help with the overcrowding, to reduce the backlog. And what I was saying about pleas is, or bond hearings, is they wanted to reduce the jail overcrowding at Lexington County. That means that for all of those weeks, they had prisoners that just piled in every day for either bond reduction so they could get out, hearings or pleas, which means they pled and they either got out on probation or they went to SCDC because they pled to criminal charges and went on to SEDC and got out of Lexington County, or they got out on the bond reduction, or they got out on bond, period, go away to trial. That's what they sent him for. Well, but we only have two judges in Lexington County. <coughs> now, Charleston has five. <coughs> Spartanburg has six. Richland has five. Lexington has two. Yeah, to talk to your legislators. <laughs> talk to your legislators. <laughs> Not to put Ronnie on the spot, but you have to talk to your legislators. And he will tell you that I am telling the truth. But people, 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 people have the, uh, the right to a speedy trial. They certainly do, by law. Hang on a second. Uh, Senator Collins has well, I, I was just going to say, uh, and we will do that. We'll raise your taxes and we will. <laughs> no, we won't. No? You, 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 you. No, I'm, I'm, if, if, if somebody, if somebody legitimately went out and hurt somebody, robbed somebody, killed somebody, trespassed somebody's property, they need to be in jail. But they don't need to be in jail until they've had a trial or they've been proven that they're guilty. You can't have people sitting in jail two, three, and four years, not even a trial. That is about as unconstitutional as you can get. McCain, we'd have to go back and see. And, and I'm not taking up for Beth, and I'm not beating her up. I'm just saying you got to go back and look at the facts, and I don't know those facts. Well, they also said but it, it, was may be, it may be that uh, 
the defense attorney said, I can't have, let me tell you, I, I appoint magistrates. And uh, the magistrates I had in Newberry County, whenever uh, I got into this position, they had like 440 cases backlogged. Now well, that, that's, they've, got, they've got 30 now that are on the dockets to be done <coughs> over the next month. So they've cleaned them up. But what happens a lot of times is, is the lawyer for that person will say, you know, I can't do it on that date. We're going to have to postpone it. So he just postponed it. And that is months. true. That, that is very true. There, there are a lot of times when we are set for hearings. There's a bond hearing. There is a trial date set. And there's a conflict. One or the other has a conflict, and it gets continued, and it gets continued, and it gets continued. It doesn't have anything to do with the defendant itself. It has to do with the attorneys on both sides, and it gets continued, and it may get continued for a year or two. It has well, nothing to do with the judicial system itself. Okay. Well, suppose, suppose, it was, suppose it was your son sitting in, in, in election in county. And, and I have and, a son, and my son is a probation officer, and I understand the judicial system from start to finish. If it were my son, I would be very upset. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm trying to explain to you how it works. Oh, well, I think we could continue that that line of conversation for a while. But Ross, stay up and wait for a while. Um, Eddie, in, in response to what she was talking about, um, Donnie Myers calls these cases when he prepares. Somebody's locked up in jail, and he investigates. He's got all you know, all the investigators, the sheriff, everybody follows his lead when it comes to, to trying to get, gather evidence for somebody to go to trial. Donnie gets, gets the evidence ready, then the solicitor's office goes to trial on that case. Um, if it's, if it's um, a bond hearing or, or whatever else, true, uh, courts have a hierarchy, so if, if an attorney is booked up in a higher court, um, then that higher court takes precedence, so then that's where that's continued. But sometimes these people sit in jail a long time waiting on the solicitor's why were they arrested if they didn't have all of their ducks in a row? Well, it's, it's kind of like the kid's slog. They go to your, your, there's a shooting, and then you go, and, and you know, what, there you stand with a gun, and, and they arrest you. That may not be all the evidence. Just because I'm standing there with a gun doesn't mean I shot anybody. Exactly. That's why they have to investigate. Okay, right. But, but my point is, is if you have an investigator, you don't have your evidence, you don't have your evidence ready, why are you arresting people? Hey, I don't want to hear about Donnie Myers because I ain't got a bit of use for him. $30,000 worth of paperwork I had on a property that the guy was supposed to build something for me, didn't do it, had a contract and everything. I submitted it to Donnie Myers, and they refused to prosecute him, and I had to go through, get a lien against the fellow, which is not worth his papers at all. Donnie Myers, as far as I know, need to get out of office. Well, Donnie Myers, if y'all go in a grocery store, I just want to make one comment about this the situation with people who are in jail and can't get out. Um, there are just a lot of people that get arrested for a lot of crimes and don't need to be on the street. Okay? That guy that they prosecute him. Yeah, they prosecute, prosecute driving down the road Sunday morning at 10.30 drunk and killed a six They prosecute them. Right. I understand that. It's that yeah. simple. I, oh, no, I, I do. And I, I, okay. Look, I do defense work, and I've sit there. I've got I've got cases where people not sit in jail, but that are four or five years old because <laughs> they hadn't called them for trial. They threatened to call them for trial, and then they never did. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. And they've had some change over in the solicitor's office. I think they got a better better group of prosecutors up there now than they've had in a long time. Um, but there are certain people that don't let illegal aliens, for example. Mm -hmm. oh they don't let them out because they're flight risk. You know what? I wish they let them out because then they'd fly. I mean, that's really not right. The law says you keep them locked up. But, I mean, I'll I give you a good example. I, I mean, I'm not involved in this particular case. But you had an illegal alien that basically committed a crime on another family of illegal aliens. So this illegal alien's in jail, and that whole family has now a visa as a, as a criminal um, uh, victim. So, so they get to stay. I mean, it's just a weird thing. John, let me make a comment before. Does anyone see yeah, the irony of having one illegal alien have a crime committed on another illegal alien? I mean, does that, something sounds wrong about that. They need to go back Both to need to go to jail. It's been illegal. 
I have a, a, a suggestion. What is the first budget? Well, you have to understand that I have several budgets, but my total budget is approximately three million dollars. And you reduced it by thirty-five percent. Right. So, and here are my numbers. So, is it two now? Or is it was it four point my question is, can we get her to to be a consultant and sit with the county council? Be glad to. You know, it's maybe, all about trying go, to do more with less. Maybe go set up the state legislature and do some things. Like fire some people. That is something. I, I wanted to address that, too. I am by far not the highest paid clerk in, in the state of South Carolina. And, you know, my salary is set by... Um, the Association of Counties, as are the other elected officials, because the state does give a small stipend to us, and it's done by a census program, and out of the 10 largest counties in the state, I'm the second lowest paid clerk in the state of South Carolina. Who's the and, lowest? Um, Anderson County. Oh, wow. And I'm the second lowest paid. At $71,714, and the state chips in a gracious $1,575, and here's my pay stub. So, you know, I'm all about transparency. I'm all about honesty. My life is an open book. Um, I brought my passport so you can see that in two, in, since 2009, I've traveled outside of the United States twice for four days, and I brought my rental records for my property in Folly Beach, because I can't possibly spend half my life in Folly Beach when my property is rented out all the time. I simply is not the case. I'm at work, I'm on the job, I'm saving you money, I'm doing what's required and expected of me because I believe in this job and I believe in saving the taxpayers' dollars. And I think that I've earned your respect and I respectfully request that you give me the opportunity to continue the progress that I've started because there's a lot more to do in Lexington County. One more question. One more question for, for Beth. Any other questions? Dr. Williams? Beth, um, I assume these deadbeat bands that you're putting in jail. They're deadbeat moms, too. Mom, well, either way. He spouse. goes both ways nowadays. I assume they can pay the payment. That's why you put them in jail. If they just don't. Well, most of the time. You know, there are instances, and you never know until you pick them up. But we always give everyone an opportunity. That's, that's the story. We don't just run out and beat someone's door in and haul them into jail. They get notice after notice after notice. They get an opportunity, and it's called a rule to show cause. We send them <coughs> notice and say, come to court, talk to the judge, tell him your circumstances, try to work it out. The judge gives them another opportunity to make the payments. Tell us your circumstances. Have you lost your job? Are you on Social Security disability benefits? Are you on unemployment? What is your set of circumstances? If they don't show up, then we issue, you know, a, a bench warrant, and you're going to jail for just not appearing, failure to appear. The point I'm going at is if they're put in jail, they can't make payments. I assume they can't work. You'd be surprised how many people come up with money when they go to jail. Yeah. And a lot of money. A lot of money when they go to jail. Beth, I mean, everybody needs to realize Beth doesn't put anybody.
Beth, thanks for being here today. And join us. Let's get her a Me at the courthouse, and if you can't find me at the courthouse, somebody there can tell you where to find me. Uh, and Beth, John, you're always welcome to come and back. I both of you have this message. I learned a lot. Learned a lot. Uh, a lot of great questions. Uh, let, me, let me just recognize Senator Ronnie Cromer, and, and Ronnie's going to come back, and he'll be our feature speaker one day, but Ronnie, you want to give us an update? No. Well, it's, there's a lot going on at the State House right now, and there's nothing going on in the State House right now. If you've been keeping up, uh, we're trying to get the governor's, primarily the governor's wishes, is for us to reorganize state government, to reform state government under the Department of Administration. And unfortunately, uh, we had a compromise or an agreement last year with the governor and everybody concerned. And when it came over to the Senate, somehow or another over the summer, in the interim, uh, there was like three senators that decided that they were going to rewrite the whole thing. Well, if, if you've ever looked at the Health Care Reform Act that was passed by Congress, it's like 2,000 pages. Well, when you take about 50 to 75 pages of changing all the agencies around, it take, you can't just write an amendment overnight, which we've done. Several of our senators have done. And then we've all got to look at it and make sure that we really didn't create some unintended circumstances. So it's taking a while. And every time we think we're about to an agreement, and can go ahead and pass it, then somebody else will come up with another stack of papers, you know, that we got to read through, read through, and try to try to decipher what's good and what's bad. So we're trying to get all that done now. Uh, I, I do want to say, you understand I was being facetious when I said raising your taxes for more judges. That's the last thing we're going to do. Now, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, I believe uh, Beth will agree with me, she is the one that comes to the Senate and the House, to the legislature, and asks for uh, extra help, you know, if she needs another judge or whatever. For the last four or five years, we all know where revenue streams uh, have been in the state, and, and they have not been good. So we are not, we, we've had to balance our budget. We can't print more money. I told you, Jim DeMint one time, I saw him at Clemson Carolina Carolina ballgame. I said, hey, I see y'all are printing more money up there. I said, we're going down to Gervais Street, and we're going to open up the old Confederate <laughs> said, well, you know, it'd probably be worth a lot more money. And the very very next week, I read in the state paper where the uh, archives had found a bunch of these old Confederate bills in the back, started selling them and putting them in our revenue. So uh, so we, we don't have that ability. We have to balance our budget. And, and I think that the people down there are working on this on a, on a regular basis, and they're doing it right now. The House is doing it right now. We just had an update Tuesday from the governor on what she wants in the new state budget this time, and we're going to try to hold to it for her, and, and hopefully we can. It's not. It's a very modest increase, I think, uh, like uh, 5.2 million or 5.4 million. It might be a little bit higher than that, but she's looking for like 200 more million in a 5 or $6 billion budget, so it's not much increase. Uh, Y'all read in the paper where we have a lot of money coming in this year, and we got a lot of surplus. That's not true. That's false. That's being put out by the state payment. A lot of it's non-recurring money that was left over from last year. And we have some deficits that were run by some former agency directors that we've got to fill in the holes. Hopefully most of that money we can put in a contingency reserve fund, and that's what we're talking about trying to do right now. We all know what's going to happen in the next year or two. I mean, the economists are predicting it. We're going to have another downturn in the economy, and when we do, uh, it would be great if we didn't have to go out and cut all these services again like we did uh, two, three years ago. If we had the money in the bank to be able to spend, to be able to, to, to keep that level of spending up and not have to make cuts. Now, that being said, uh, there are a couple things we can do. One, one of the governor's uh, prerogatives is trying to uh, cut the state income tax. And if we can ever do that, I think we can bring even more industry into South Carolina because a lot of these businesses will come in and see where they've got to pay 5% on corporate income tax and they'll say, I'm going to go into Florida, and you know, that 5% on the amount of money that they're making is a lot of money that keeps them, keeps them from coming into South Carolina. And I, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent. Uh, Beth did a good job this morning explaining her position. And uh, and again, I was just kidding when I said raise taxes to hire more lawyers. Look at him. I read the um, new health care law. It took me like forever. Oh, you know, absolutely. Check section if, such if and you such. Read it, you were ahead of about 99.9% of the people in the United States. Especially the Congress. Yeah, um, Congress yeah. However, 
Is there any effort being made to make legislation more readily available for someone even with a college education? I have two, and it took me forever. No, it's, it's, it's not it's that hard. It's got to be. You go on SCStatehouse.net, and they've got several search engines on there. If you know the bill number, you can just type in the bill number, and it will immediately pop up. If you don't, you may have to put in keywords like sales tax or whatever mm -hmm. you're looking for. It's just when I'm reading these things, there's like loophole A, loophole B, loophole A. <laughs> yeah. And, well, it's, listen, it's, uh, these are legal terms. And mm -hmm. John Kerry will tell you that when you start getting into, any, into legal terms, I would imagine John probably has a hard time sometimes just searching through all the codes in mm -hmm. South Carolina to find out what he's going to tell his client. That's right. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's just that. Well, they're written by attorneys. <laughs> Can you make them, them, really them, them, <laughs> make them we, a little easier to work? Yeah. Even college-educated people can understand them without having to... I wish I could yeah. go write all this stuff for them. Yeah. Um, they, 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 maybe that's a new job for yeah. you. <laughs> I, mean, they, I mean, I'll give you a good example. This is something you want to look at. <laughs> your, your assault battery statute. It, is so, it was written by a doctor. Okay. And I think actually a doctor who ultimately got indicted for some kind of insurance fraud. Right? <laughs> um, needless to say, it is so convoluted and confusing. I don't think they could convict anybody of a first degree assault in this state if they tried. I mean, it's that convoluted. Well, it should. That's just an example, but yeah. it shouldn't be written in legalese to where majority of the public can understand it. Because if you're, are you an attorney? Yes. Because if you, as an attorney, can read it and not fully comprehend it and have to spend way beyond the normal amount of time to research it.